Welcome everybody to Dixon's Virtual Bunch of Learn. My name is Margarita Sandino. I am the Director of Education. Um, I have been at the Dixon for over 13 years, so I hope you have seen me before. Uh, I will be hosting some of these Bunch of Learns with Sarah Lorenz and some other of our uh, staff members. Lindley Schmidt will be um, joining us hopefully very soon. Uh, she is the one that programs and organizes these Bunch of Learns. Um, I will ask you to please take a minute to mute yourself. Sometimes when you uh, join, uh, you have a pre-setting and you may not be muted. Uh, also, don't feel too bad if I mute you. If you unmute yourself by mistake or and it's loud, I'll mute you. Sorry. Um, this session will be recorded and we will try to upload this on our website, uh, on our YouTube uh, account uh, next week. Uh, we try to do it weekly so that way people can get a chance to catch up and I get a chance to catch up on uploading things. Um, during the talk, if you have any questions, uh, please, uh, if you look down on the bottom, you'll see uh, a little bubble uh, that says chat. Just click on that and enter your questions there. We'll have a little time at the end for some questions. Uh, today's Munch and Learn title is In Living Color, Looking More Carefully at the Dixon Collection. And today we have a, 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 a treat. Uh, it is Kevin Sharp, the Linda W. and S. Herbert Ray Director at the Dixon Gallery and Gardens here with us. He uh, is not only our director, he's my boss, um, and he uh, has been the organizer of this really, the most uh, recent reinstallation of the permanent collection uh, at the Dixon, and this is what he wants to tell us more about. So yes, the Dixon is open, that awesome exhibit is there, and uh, after you hear this talk, I hope you have a chance to kind of get to the Dixon uh, and see the show. I, I promise you, you will see the collection in a different way. So. Uh, let's give Kevin Sharp a very warm, vo virtual, silent welcome. Thank you, Kevin. Well, uh, thank you, Margarita. And let's see all those those hand clapping emojis. <laughs> we were, for those of you who came in late, we were having a conversation about uh, probably a much too in depth conversation about about my um, not using emojis. Anyway, um, it's great to have you all. Great to have you all here. Um, yeah, it, it's one of the one of the really wonderful things for me. One of the reasons why the Dixon is just the perfect institution for for um, for me to be a part of is that is that I not only you know I'm not only responsible for administering the 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 museum. I get to be a little part of lots of things here. Um, we we are. You know, we are kind of chronically shorthanded in every area. We could, well, every department could use another, you know, another staff person or two. And, um, and, and that's, you know, I mean, that's not necessarily by design, but it, but it does mean that we all work together. We all chip in. We all are, we are all educators at the Dixon. We are all curators at the Dixon. We are all fundraisers at the Dixon. And, um, and what that what that means is it's you know it is there's a very healthy team ethos at at the Dixon because we all understand what our colleagues are trying to trying to accomplish and we are all trying to trying to help them accomplish it and so I didn't really plan um, to be the person who organized the the, the most recent. Um, installation of the permanent collection but for a for a variety of circumstances it kind of sh just shook out that way and um and we began to i began talking with um i began talking with julie parati our our curator about um you know what's what will the what will the organizing what should the organizing principle be around this installation um because we try to we try to shake it up and we try to find different ways to understand the collection. And um, and we've done over the years and I, I won't get this I won't get this in the proper order. But over the years, I mean, we've 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 presented the permanent collection across the entirety of, of the museum, every gallery. Um, that's not the case this time, but there's more of the permanent collection up than there usually is. And we've we've organized those those 
reinstallations by, I mean, we've done it by, by date and period where we're, you know, we're kind of sort of art historical and wonky in that way, where we're looking at, where we're moving from, you know, the bar, our Barbizon school things to our impressionist things, to our post-impressionist things, to our more modern works. And, and you know, I love those. I love that installation. And then we've, we've done it um, by collection. And that was, that was kind of a favorite as well, where we had all of the Dixon paintings in the same gallery together in the plow gallery along with along with the correspondence that mr dixon sent to various dealers and the, the letters that dealers wrote back to him uh, about the things that he was interested in and there was also this really incredible dialogue between if, if, through correspondence between mr dixon and john rewald who wrote the, the first English language history of Impressionism, really an important figure in that movement. So that was, you know, and then we had the Ritchie pictures together and we had the, the all the forans that we bought together and we had all the museum purchases together. And that was an interesting way to to present the to present the collection as well. And then, you know, we've done it. We've done it by subject you know, all the landscapes here, all the still lives. And so we were kind of, kind of struggling for, you know, an idea. And, um, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I think I'll share the screen now. If that's all right. We were kind of, um, we were kind of struggling for a, um, you know, for, you know, an organizing, an organizing principle. And, um, and it, was really just not quite, not quite coming to us. Um, and, you know, I mean, almost, almost, um, almost as a, it wasn't, wasn't a joke, but it was um, kind of a throwaway remark. And it's the kind of thing that happens when, um, you know, when we're all in the, when we're all in the building together, just talking about stuff, you know, it was definitely not a meeting about how do we, how do we organize the permanent collection? It was just a conversation. I said, why don't we do it by color? And, you know, we chuckled a little bit. And then the more I, the more I thought about it, you know, the more I thought about it, the more, you know, the more I liked it, you know, it, um, you know, it, it, it does some things it does some things, and I'm going to walk you through walk you through some slides. It does some things that um, you know that that you can't really you can't really present any other way, you know. And um, what what one of the things that that you know Margarita and I have been talking about for you know going on 14 years now is this idea of this idea of visual literacy, this idea that, you know, in part because of the age we live in, you know, when we're, when we're overloaded, we're actually bombarded with moving pictures on a, on a screen, like we're looking at right now. Um, but also, you know, anytime you go to any website, anytime you turn on your television, anytime, you know, and these images, these images are are fleeting and they're and they're racing by and and you know we've we've I'm not saying we've lost the ability, but we're not. I don't think we're as as good at looking carefully, looking really carefully as perhaps previous generations were. I think we're really good at watching and less good at seeing. And so what, what making this installation less art historical or thematic or, or collection based and just picking out things based on the color they were is, um, I, it, it, I, it, it introduced some, to me, some very interesting, interesting juxtapositions. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a few of those um, I'm going to show you a few of those today. So here, this is just a this is just a phone pic I took of the of the green room. We're in the we're in the Wilmot Gallery, and um, and you know we you know we arrange things in in this space so they made a made a certain amount of sense. And what I found 
Um, what I found when I was when I was laying out the laying out the the, the the paintings that I thought were that where green was the color that had the most either had the most to say about in any given painting or was critical to to moving you through the painting. It, it you know this the Wilmot Gallery becomes a kind of history of the color green in the nineteenth in the in the 19th and early 20th century. And if you look at if you move from the green of this our early Monet, this painting from 1870, um, uh, painted on the painted on the Normandy coast, it is it is very much in uh, the green. It the, the greens are much more similar to earlier Barbizon painting green the Coro in our collection or the Daubigny in our collection or even the Stanislaus Lapine in our collection than it is this George Seurat and, and, um, and Paul Gauguin in, um, you know, from just, you know, a few years later, the, the, the palette lightens considerably. The Barbizon painters used a really kind of dark green. The Impressionists used a lighter green. And as you move into into the 20th century, um, and these this is two these are two paintings. One, the one on the right is by Kayam Soutine, who was a um, I believe he was born in Lithuania, but he's painting in the south of France. He moves to Paris in the 19 in the 1910s and um, or slightly before, and um, and then has been works for much of his career in the south of France. And the painting on the left is Alice Beach Winter, and she's painting, she owned a home in and painted many summers in Gloucester. And so in Massachusetts. So these two artists couldn't come from, you know, they're different genders, they come from very different backgrounds. Um, they are in, in decidedly very different places. But they, but the interesting thing is they both of these paintings were made in 1921. And so there, they were painting at the same moment. And there are some commonalities in the in the Kayam Soutine. You know, there are all these houses on the slope of a, of a slope of a hill, and this is a figure who is moving through uh, moving through the landscape. There's no figure in Alice B. Twinner's painting, but she too is showing us the side of a hill with a house perched on it. But look at the green. Look at the green. They're they're practically. Now they're surrounded by different colors, but they're, the greens are practically identical. And so I think that it, it, color is, and, and, and color is a kind of, has come in and out of fashion and shades of color have come in and out of fashion for, you know, forever. This isn't just a Pantone moment thing. This is something that has, that has always existed. And so I found these, there, all, there are, intriguing pairings throughout the throughout the installation. Now I'm going to show you um, a, a, just a few works and um, and kind of explain my my rationale for why it, you know why any given work is in any given room. We're still in the green room. This is Camille Pizarro's Jetty at Lav, um, High Tide Morning Sun 1903. This is one of the last paintings that that Pizarro made. He died just months after this after this work was made and, and I was initially I was initially thinking that this would go this painting would go in the red room you know even though it's got you know you know this acre of blue gray sky and this and this green you know this green ocean and the harbor you know look at look at look at what Pizarro does with red you know there's a dash there's a dash of red on this umbrella and this dress and he spots red throughout the crowd who are queuing up to get on the to get on the ferry, and then he gives you these semaphore flags. So the red, red, um, you know, could have this could for me this could have been this could have gone in the red room, but I put it in green one because there was so much green in the in the in the port and in the inner harbor. But you know, look at you know, look at here's what artists do. Here's what artists do when they when they load up a brush, when they load up a brush with paint, you know, they don't. I mean, they work throughout the canvas 
And what, where he, what persuaded me, what persuaded me to, to embrace the green, which is far more green than red in this painting, but what, what persuade is that, you know, is this, look at that little line, that little line of green along the side of the, you know, along the side of the, this building, this man's suit, you know, he's he, he got a nice little shot of green there. And then, you know, yeah, there's a red umbrella and that's maybe one you see, but there's also a green one, green one here. And I think that that green for this painting and then look how really green the inner port is when you, when you begin to look at it, when you begin to look at it carefully. And I think this is where, this is where this particular installation is going to reward anybody who spends time in the show and bothers to look. And Bob, I mean, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm like anybody, you know, I mean, Paul made a, made a perfect, uh, 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 he kind of named the perfect painting to walk in and have it just wash all over you when he described, when he described, um, you know, the Monet water lilies, whether it's the one in St. Louis or any, or the ones in the Orangerie in Paris or wherever they are, those are paintings that you can just kind of get lost in. And they can, you know, just wash over you and they're so beautiful and the color is so um, intense in a way. Um, but even those works will reward you if you take the time, if you take the time to look carefully. And, you know, the thing that I, the thing that I really enjoy looking at paintings from a very close range and no one has, no one has gotten in trouble with security guards in museums more than me, you know, um, cause I, you know, I just, you know, I'm their worst nightmare. I'm the one that wants to come in really close, but there's a reason for it. You know, I love how, how, you know, these are all perfectly legible as, you know, as a woman and a child and two women and a man and another child, you know, and, but look at what a mess it is. And I, you know, it's the mess that I like. I like that, you know, that Pizarro has laid this down with such, with such speed and, and bravado. And then, you know, you know, color is often, I mean, the way we think of color in the context of, of painting, of representational painting anyway, is, well, it's a sky, of course it's blue, but the color does the color does so much more than that, really, in a painting. Remember, it's remember Maurice um, Denis, the 19th century painter's great edict that before a, before a painting is a nude or a war horse or whatever it is, it's just a square piece of canvas with greasy material on it. And I love finding the greasy material, the oily material of paint. Look at these. I mean, it's a it's a pile of stones or something that you know that you can that reads as a pile of stones when you get back away from it. It coalesces beautifully, but up close, I mean, you really see that what it actually is is a bunch of brush strokes, and I love that, and I love that. I mean, they're so obviously brush strokes. So anyway, it's um, so you know it's you could argue with. Um, you know, with the placement, that was part of the idea, you know, that, that some things would, you know, it's like, well, why is this in the, why is this in the red gallery? Why is this in the black gallery? Why is this in, you know, I mean, I, I'm hoping that people are having those kinds of, those kinds of conversations with, you know, with their friends as they come through the, through the museum. This is a, for me, this was a no brainer. This is our Henri Gervex. It's a you know a large pastel woman with a fan. It's from 1888, and it's in the it is in the Black Gallery, and it, it obviously it belongs there. I mean, look at this fabulous, fabulous black dress, and you know he uses this black pastel to really communicate the 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 the, the look and the feel of lace. I mean, I don't know I don't know anything about about fashion. Julie could tell you what kind of what kind of dress this is, but, you know, but, you know, I knew that this was one that would, that would make sense as, um, as, as a work of art in the black gallery. Um, and that, you know, the tabletop, the edge of the table, he's used black and, and there's bits of black reflected in this glass vase. But when you move in close, 
when you move in close. And, you know, this is the, this is the wonderful thing about pastel is this kind of, you know, I mean, what I, what I would love to do, you know, and our, our register, our registrar would have a heart attack if she heard me say this, you know, I would love to show pastels without the glazing in front of them, you know, cause uh, you know, it's the, I mean, it's such a wonderful way to see pastel cause you see the bloom, you see the, you see how fragile and friable that, that, you know, that material is. It's just, I mean, all you're looking at is raw pigment, raw pigment on the surface of, you know, in this case, on the surface of a canvas. And it's just so incredibly beautiful. And, and, you know, I get to look at pastels this way and you're getting to look at it because this pastel was photographed out of its frame. And so you're seeing it, even though you're seeing a reproduction, and you're looking at it on a computer screen, you're seeing it unmediated, you know, by that, that the filtering quality of museum glass. And you're also seeing why black makes so much sense for this work, because in addition to this, this stunning gown that this young woman is, is wearing, you know, there's also, you know, this black in her little, I don't, whatever this thing is, I mean, her flowers in her hair, I guess it's a ribbon, this black ribbon in her hair, which makes perfect sense. But then look at this little daisy. Look at, I don't know if it's a real daisy or a, or a daisy made, you know, a, a, a synthetic daisy for the, for the ribbon. It could be either way, but I love that, you know, he needed black. See that, that one black line that defines the center of, of this, you know, of this um, little headpiece of this little ribbon. And then a few strokes of black to, to kind of accentuate the, the shadows in her hair. But here is, and then they're also, I mean, re, you know, I mean, the background, he's used black and then covered it up in places like this, um, but it still, it still shows through. Um, and, you know, and then her shadow cast on the, cast on the background right here is, is made with black and these squiggly lines here, but he starts looking out, look at how, you know, he's used this white, these white lines just to put a little highlight. Look at that, you know, and, and you, you wouldn't have seen those white lines when we looked at the entire composition, but when you come in close, that's where you find these, these wonderful little magical things that artists do to make their, to make their work convincing. But here's why, here's why it ultimately wound up in black. And that's, you know, look at those eyes, look at the, look at those, those little pupils. They're just little dots of black and, and, the, and the, her, her blue gray eyes are outlined in black. And so it, it, black takes you all the way through the gown, all the way to the top of her head. It informs the background of the of this pastel, and it but it also is you know it creates you know it creates something I mean something of the sparkle in in her eyes. And so for me, it's like yeah, this I know exactly where this is going. And now we move into the red into the um, into the red gallery. And this could have, I mean, this, this Boudin view of Venice, I mean, it's just a quintessential view of Venice where you're looking at Santa Maria della Salute and the, and the custom house. It's, you know, and it's just, you know, it's just, I mean, it's just a beautiful work, you know, and Venice is, is obviously, you know, an incredibly paintable um, city and it just begs to be recorded and it's been recorded many many times and and this is a late work for Boudin painted in in 1895 and um and it's just and it's it, you know and you know obviously blue kind of a blue gray sky and lots of blue water why isn't this in the blue room well you know the blue is just kind of a background in a way for all the action that's going on in the, in this painting, and it's it's a kind of overall, you know, that is almost like the surface of the canvas itself. It's to me, it's actually the red that travel that that carries you through this, that gets you through this work. Now, there's a reason why there's this little red squiggle, little package you know, in the gondola, right in right in the foreground, and you know, and if you move. If you move to the left, you see that he's used red to to just a drop of red, just a drop of pure red to to um, 
create the face of this man leaning on a rail. And then it's the red that travels across all these roofs. And it takes you, and it takes you all the way through, all the way through the painting. I think very, you know, very successfully. And then there, you know, it's like, as, as I said with Pizarro, I mean, you know, he's loaded up, he's loaded up red. You know, I mean, there's one red that's capturing, you know, the rooftops across here generally it's kind of a kind of a russety red but you know but he's also then he takes out a kind of pure looks to me like a cadmium red and you know and it's like i'm just going to punch it up and it's probably the same brush load of paint that makes this little squiggle that get that drop it's a little drop in this face that highlights and intensifies the color on the roof. Look at that, that's a, that's a line right there of kind of perfect cadmium. And it just, and it just works. And, then, and, and by the time he's out, by the time that brush load of paint has been, has been delivered to the canvas to do the exact things he wants to do with it, he takes it, he takes his dry brush and just rubs it across, rubs it across this area here, just beyond the gondola. For, for for no good reason that I can say. Um, I mean, it might it might have been a, it might have been reflecting something. It might have been anything, but it's it to me it signals that Boudin was using this using this color as a guide to get you through the entirety of the the entirety of the painting. I just kind of love it. I just kind of love it, and you know, this is a this is a gondolier or somebody in the in the um, in the back of that gondola. You're seeing the very back of it right here, and you know, I mean, he it's like he's got a hat, he's got a collar, he's got a he's got his suit of clothes on, but he could have he could have just as easily taken this little red drop and dropped it in. You're actually seeing no face at all. You know, you're looking at the water right through where his, where his head might be. Anyway, I'm not second guessing Boudin, I'm just saying things, impressionist painting happen really fast sometimes and not everything gets accounted for. Now, this painting is not in the installation, but I love this picture and I, I've, become, I've become quasi obsessed with it. It's um, Jean-Francois Raffaelli's La Place d'Italy after the after the rain and it's made in May 1877 and we know it's May 1877 because he dates it May 18 and he and he even writes Place d'Italy um, après la pluie um, so we know it's just rain but we would know it just rain because there's all these umbrellas everywhere um, and you know I you know this painting is. Um, the Place d'Italy is on the is on the left bank of Paris. It's nowhere near where Raffaelli lived at the time. He was on the he lived on the right bank. We don't know why. We don't know why exactly um, he's he chose this particular spot. It's fairly non it's fairly nondescript. Um, there there are interesting things interesting things about it. It is a, a one of the plas one of the plazas that was um, designed by Baron Haussmann in the, in the 1860s. This used, to be, this used to be the city gates right here of Paris. Um, I can't remember exactly um, where, where the names of each of these roads, but they, um, but they led to spe you know, specific places, obviously. And this, these were like, this was like a custom house. And this is almost identical to it another custom house where if you were bringing in agricultural products, you know, in the, in the late 18th century or early 19th century, you would have to pass through here to pay your, to pay your tariff. And um, it's in the 13th arrondissement of Paris. And he's actually in the, the, um, oh, I, I guess I can't think of what the French call it, but it's you know kind of in the courthouse for the 13th arrondissement. And he's climbed to an upper floor and he's looking down into the place and he's made, mostly made this painting on site. And, you know, you would know that he's in some kind of civic building because look at 
These are all gendarmes. Everybody who's got red pants on are gendarmes. And, you know, and so they probably report to the very building that, that Raffaele is painting from. And, and like I said, we, it, I've, I've never been a, able to quite figure out why he chose this particular, this particular destination, but, it, but it's a, a slice of Parisian life that I just love. And, you know, and all of this, all of this architecture you see in the background was built, you know, was built in the renovation of Paris in the, in the 1850s and 1860s. And it still went on re, uh, to some degree, even after the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. And if I was to place this work if I was to place this work anywhere, I would probably, even though the, 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 the color, the, the dominant color that you see is mostly a kind of, a kind of muted gray. Um, you know, the sky has got this incredible brushwork and, and, you know, it's, it's, we've just experienced a, you know, this rain. And so there's this amazing, you know, these puddles everywhere and they're kind of gray, but it's really, once again, this pop of red, I would have put this in the red gallery because it walks you through the composition. I mean, look, you know, you see the gendarme here front and center to pull you into the pull you into the composition. And then you move you move through the painting. And, and if you look carefully, I mean, there's another gendarme walking. Look at that little touch of red in this woman's dress. Another man with red pants. And then look at these four, one, two, three, four more men with red pants in the if, if far into the distance. And, um, and then over here, little lines of red here and there. And I think it, I think it really helps get you through the composition. But you know, one of the things that, that I love, and I love it when artists go to the trouble to show you things, you know, look at this. I, 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 I just, we just captured this, this one little detail by accident. You know, I, I, you know, I didn't ask the, is that, that this running man be in this detail. I was interested in all the things that's read and he's certainly not read, but isn't that interesting? You know, and these are the things I think particularly in impressionist era paintings, and it may be why I love these paintings so much is that they are paintings of modern life. And sometimes when we're late for an appointment, and it's been raining and we don't know that it isn't going to start raining again, we run. We run across the street and there he is. Ah, I just, I'm, I'm just, I just love this work. And then, you know, I'm fascinated by this thing. I'm convinced these are two undertakers carrying a coffin. Here are more gendarme right here in the right, here in the right foreground. But here's the thing that just cracks me uh but uh, you know hopefully you'll think it's funny too got any idea what these two guys are doing does it does it look at all familiar to you this is a piece wow <laughs> well said i think that was bill mckelvey well said yeah i mean i you know i looked at this painting i've looked at this painting a million times and it was only when I got, you know, I wrote the catalog entry for our upcoming collection catalog um, <laughs> on, the, on this particular painting. And so I, I became obsessed with, 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 with understanding every element of the composition. And, you know, I found this kind of late in my looking and it just cracked me up. So what are they doing again? I didn't quite catch that. I'm, I'm sorry, can you say that question again? Yes, can you tell me what the two guys are doing? I didn't catch what you said. Well, I didn't say, I didn't say. Oh, I saw the other man say it, okay. Yeah, they, um, but it, they are, uh, they are urinating is what they are doing. And so it's not necessarily, not necessarily a theme we associate with high art, but it happens from time to time. It happens from time to time. Up oh. now, this is um, this is this is one of my favorite collect works in the um, in the Dixon collection. Um, this is kind of a pre-impressionist painting by an artist named Paul Gigou, and Gigou is not an artist that probably a lot of people a lot of people know. Um, he 
he was kind of a contemporary of the of the Barbizon school, but he worked in the south of France, um, in the in the marshes near uh, Marty, and um, and this painting is small. I mean, what you're what you're probably seeing on your computer screen is twice the size of the actual of the actual painting. I mean, it's I don't know maybe you know maybe a foot wide, something like that. So it's small. And it's precious, and and it is. I think there are any number of elements that were captured with a um, with a single hairbrush, um, and I put it in. You know, I put it in the in the blue gallery um, just because I you know I love all you know this this south this southern France blue sky um, and the blue mountains in the in the distance. But you know, but look at the way look at the way Gigu uses this you know uses this blue. I mean, again, it is like a it is like a roadmap for carrying you through the painting. And you know, there, we're looking at the right side of the composition, and here's the village of Martigues on the on the right side of this of this swampy area. You know, here's a hunter, and he's carrying a rifle, and he's got a bag with his probably probably hunting birds. Um, for his, um, his, it's not catch. I can't think what hunters call what they, anyway, it doesn't matter. He's there. It's a thing he puts the birds he shoots in and, you know, here's his hunting dogs. You know, there, this one's a, obviously a scent hound and he's, he's sniffing around and here's a, another hunter, or maybe a fisherman, probably a hunter as well, just off to the right. But look at how, look at how Gigu, Look at how he walks you through the painting, through all of this blue. It just carries you. It just travels you to every place he wants. He wants you to see. And if you look at the other side of the painting, you know it's the same thing. You know he. This is the left side, and and he's marched, marched, marched you through. There are two more figures walking down this, walking down this path that will eventually lead you to to the village. And um, you know here's the path itself. You know, um, and it's just you know blue, it, and it's this luminous sky blue that's re that that's reflecting the, the sky itself, and I find it I find it just utterly utterly beautiful, and um, and so and so incredibly convincing, and I love an artist that will work this small, and work with this this amount of detail without it seeming fussy or or you know it, this painting reads bigger than it actually is because it's got a perfect balance of uh elegantly wrought detail with broad passages and that and to understand that you know where he's painted broadly look at this it's again it's a brush stroke that's nothing more than a brush stroke and he just you know he, he just Kind of leaves it there. He could have smoothed it out, but I, you know, I like the way that the white, the creamy white and the green are blended together the way paint does and will do. And it's just, I don't know, it's, it, you know, it's just, to me, it's just evidence, evidence of the artist's hand. And I like finding that in works of art, but I also like an artist who will show you how to get through the painting, how to enter it, how to exit it. And Gigu does that brilliantly. Um, this is just this is not in the in the installation either, um, but it's just such a it's just such a glorious thing. It's in the it's in the America's Impressionist show. It's this Charles Courtney Curran painting we bought in 2016. Um, evening illuminations at the Paris Exposition, and the the way he uses color it just really really matters in this work of art. You've probably heard me tell this before. I mean, you know, they're at the 1889 World's Fair in Paris, the same World's Fair that gave us the Eiffel Tower. But it's all, but also at that same fair was a demonstration of Edison's electric light. And that's what you're looking at right here. And look at the, the range of colors that emanate from that, that, that electric, that electric beam of light. And, you know, and look how transfixed there are. And I love that. I love that in this tiny, tiny painting, much smaller than what you're looking at probably right now, unless you're looking at it on your phone, um, this tiny painting, they're, they're probably 
75, 100 figures accounted for in this work. And so, again, this is a this is a small canvas that invites you to look very, very carefully because there are things to be seen like all of these umbrellas and an umbrella that's been that's been closed up and all of these top hats that are appearing here and there and all of these people riveted by what they're seeing. And so Edison's electric light is this multicolor you know, greens and yellows and pinks and blues. And, but over here, over here, you're seeing the gas light. That's, that's just kind of gold, golden orange. And if you look really carefully, I mean, you can see that this one man who's probably lit a match, you know, and look at how it, ref, how it reflects in his, how it reflects in his face. It's just, I think extraordinary. And if you think about it, what you're really, what you're really seeing here is a group of people looking into the future. You know, they're looking at, they're looking at electricity, you know, maybe some for the, for the first time, yet they're surrounded by gaslight. And I just love what I just, you know, I love what Curran, what Curran did here. I, the, the supposition it is that this is Curran's wife, whose name I can't recall right now. But each one of these figures is, look at this woman right here and this older man right here. Um, each one, none of, these, none of these figures are phoned in. Each one is particularized and none more so than this man who's looking down. And this may be Curran himself, actually. And this man looking down at, the glow of a match. I'm just, uh, I, I, I'm just in awe of painters to begin with. And I'm all in awe of painters who reward me so generously if I just take, you know, a fraction of the time looking at a painting that they took to make the painting. I love this picture. You know, we did a current, we did the current retrospective in, um, I don't know, 2012 or something like that. And this painting was in it. And we all decided that this, these early works where Curran lavished so much attention on his subjects were the, were the ones that we admired the most. And so when this one became available, you know, we jumped all over it. All right, all right. And this is a, this is a painting we, we bought in, um, that was bought for us actually in in 2018. It was um, it was purchased by an anonymous donor in memory and in honor of Joe Orgel, who was um, one of the most important supporters, former board chair that the Dixon has ever had. And it's um, you know H.O. Tanner, as many of you know, was the probably the first African American artist to achieve really international stardom. Um, he was from the Philadelphia area, found the, the prejudice um, in, in Philadelphia, was going to hinder the progress of his, what he hoped would be a brilliant career. He was trained by Thomas Aikens. He was talented just from the very beginning, and he goes to Paris, and he has a hugely, hugely successful career. Mo he's a very pious man, very religious man, and he paints, mostly he paints biblical subjects, and there was, even, even in um, the 1890s and, and early 20th century, there was still a, a strong market for that kind, of, that kind of subject matter, and he was very, very, very successful. Um, and, but this is, this is Tanner, you know, not long after he arrives in Paris, maybe a couple of years into his into what would be a permanent stay, and he's he's walking the city and he's finding you know he's just looking at you know looking at the city and learning the city and you know he's on the he's on the right bank of the Seine and he's um, um, looking at you know the the Ile Saint Louis right here and Notre Dame as it looked in 1896 and as it hopefully will look again someday. And, you know, these, these tugs that are, um, that are um, harbored on the, along the side of the river. And, and Julie Parati and I argued for the longest time about what we were actually looking at. Okay, so we know from looking at the Charles Courtney Curran painting 
that I just showed you that electric light was something that was coming to Paris, France. It was actually, you know, I mean, it came much earlier than that, but it was still a bit of a novelty. But we know that Paris was, or that Notre Dame was illuminated by, by some kind of electric light by, um, you know, by 1896, when Tanner is, um, is walking the streets of the city. But I, you know, I was not convinced that we were actually looking at a nocturne. You know, you know, because one, it's one thing to light up all, all of Notre Dame. It's another thing to light up the entirety of the Ile Saint Louis, and which I'm not sure was not sure was happening. I was suggesting that we were seeing the light popping out after a after a thunderstorm, after a rainstorm, and the sun is the sun is peeking out maybe through the af out, uh, through the afternoon clouds and is shining on the side of Notre Dame and on the, and on the houses of the Ile Saint Louis. And Julie just, Julie just wouldn't believe it, you know, and um, she's stubborn that way. And she, um, and so we, you know, we debated and debated and, and Julie was writing the catalog entry for this thing. And so, you know, she wrote it her way, you know, that, um, that you know, this was electric light that we're seeing. And, um, and then we decided that, well, this would make a great cover for our collection catalog, okay? So we photographed it super high res and blew it up, blew it up. And, um, and it will make a great cover because, you know, we're, and we're an American museum and H.O. Tanner was an American artist, um, but we're Americans hugely interested in Paris and this is Paris and we're Memphis is a city on a major river. And so is, and we're looking at the Seine, a major river here. And, and so we, you know, it's, it made sense as the cover of the book for, for multiple reasons. So it will be the cover of the book. And then, you know, the designer, the designer is showing us images and he says, well, the thing that I really like about this, and he's looking at these high res photographs, very large. He said, I love the rainbow. In it. See that? See that? You know what we call that? And it, you know, it's kind of, he paints over it a little bit, but he leaves just a touch of rainbow down here. And you know what we call, you know what we call this? You know, what we call this rainbow. We call it vindication. We call it vindication. And so Julie had to go back and rewrite her catalog entry. Um, and had we not, had we not made this the cover of the book, I'm not sure, I'm not sure we would have quite figured this out because this in real life, and this painting is actually not in the installation either, it's in the America's Impressionism show too. It is, um, you know, it's not easily seen with the naked eye, you know, and this is where, you know, photography kind of helps. And look at the roof of Notre Dame. Come back, come back to us, come back to us. So, um, you know, this is another Julie Parati triumph, actually. This is, uh, this we love, she just bought this. Victoria Dubourg, still life um, with brioche. And look at that beautiful brioche. And we, I put this in the, in the white gallery because I just love the way, I just love the way Victoria Dubourg used white, you know, the white of the tablecloth is so crisp and believable, this compote. But it's also, you know, the, the little touches, the little touches of white, pure white that ripple through this porcelain chocolate pot. You know, that after the whole thing is painted, that she lays right on top, that completely, that completely bring this thing, bring this thing to life. It's just sensational. And then I'll I'll end with I'll end with see oh we're doing good for once I'm kind of paying attention to time um, this you know this diga is just so marvelous now people I'll, uh, how do I say this I mean this painting was this painting was in the diga at the opera show I mean the curators at the Musée d'Orsay um, love this work. And it went to the National Gallery, but then COVID hit and it sort of sat in the dark for a while. Um, and it's in the dining room right now in the orange and yellow gallery. And, um, 
And, you know, the, the, and, you know, it's not a conventional work, you know, I mean, so many of Degas' dancer subjects are just beautiful and, you know, and this one really kind of is not. And part of the reasons, you know, some of his dancer subjects are so beautiful is that they're not actually dancing. You know, they're, you know, they're caught, they're captured in the wings or they're, or they're rehearsing or they're stretching or they're doing other things that are just sort of, you know, more attractive in a way as, as poses. And this one, he's captured this dancer in kind of mid, mid movement. And I'm convinced that, um, I'm convinced of a couple of things. One, I'm convinced that this painting was painted over a monotype that in the, uh, that it was painted in about 18, maybe 91, 92. Um, and that it was painted over a monotype that Degas made a print, basically, and you know, a, 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 a kind of glorified ink drawing um, that he made probably sometime in 1870, 1870, no, 1874, 1875. And I think that for a lot of reasons. One, the, you know, this is a dancer on stage. We know this background, this bright orange background from other other paintings by. Degas and, and drawings from that period. Um, Degas kind of stops painting dancers on stage um, after about the mid 1870s. And they, and they go into rehearsal rooms or in the wings, as I said, but this is one on stage and she's, she's the stage light is captured her, you know, her neck and lower and lower face. And, um, and the reason we think that he, painted it later is because of all this orange. Dega by 18, okay, so if the, the original monotype was from you know, 18, the mid 1870s, um, by the late 1880s, Dega, Dega was, his eyesight had deteriorated to the point where he could no longer read, except the largest possible print. I mean, he couldn't just sit down and, and read a book. And whether it was because of his diminishing eyesight, that's one very plausible theory. He began to he began to intensify the um, his color, and it, 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 some people would say his color became coarser. And maybe it did, but it, to me, it doesn't become coarser. It just becomes more expressive. And orange gets laid down as an underpaint as a base, so everything has a certain kind of, that he paints over the top, has a certain glow beneath it. And then he puts more orange right on top. And I think this element, I mean, it could just be a rock on stage, but I kind of, I, it could also be the head of somebody in the orchestra that's radically in the foreground. And then he uses this, he uses this orange you know, to cap, you know, to capture the shoes, the background, you know, her lips. I mean, it, it is a color that he uses to, I think, tremendous, tremendous effect and, um, and great expressive power. And, um, and it's also interesting to me that, that Degas goes back and mines his own earlier work for later inspiration when when he needs it. it was almost as if he'd been working for he worked for decades just to just to have have work that he could use as the basis for later compositions um i'm, I'm sure that's not the case but it but it worked out that way and so you know that's this is my i think this is the end of my end of my presentation and I, it is, um, I hope that you'll see that, you know, arranging the permanent collection in this way has offered us some, you know, particular, you know, particular pleasures that we might not have enjoyed otherwise. And I just thank you for, thank you for, um, for being with us today. And I'll bring you all, I'll bring you all okay. back. Thank you, Kevin. That was really cool. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
I, I really discovered like a thousand things I've never seen in the paintings. Thank you. Um, I don't Definitely. think I have any, Thank you. any specific questions uh, at this point, but I have one. Please. So here's my question. I know you work really hard on selecting these paintings for each color area or each room, you know, based on the color. Did that forever ruin how you look at the paintings? Are you always going to look for, oh, this could go in the red or this could go in the green? Well, if it did, it ruined me, you know, 40 right. years ago or something, you know, I mean, I have this, I have this powerful affinity for color. I mean, I, I'm convinced it's why I do what I, I do what I do. And, you know, and this, you know, um, but, but, you know, to answer your question, even uh, hopefully a bit more completely, um, you know, I'm also able to kind of, you know, think about paintings in more ways than one, you know, and colors only, color is only, only part of it. Um, so no, I don't think it's, I don't think it's ruined. It's, it's a great question. But I don't think it's ruined anything for me. But, but I guess mm -hmm. it remains to be seen. Yeah, because now I go through it and I go, hmm, this could be here mm -hmm. or this could be there. Uh, but I do, I do like the idea of actually confusing people about it. It's like <laughs> this has no red in here. Why is this in the green? So it makes you look. It makes you actually go back and what is he talking about? Why is this red? Uh, so I really, I really like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I do too. I, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, when I give, when I give tours of the dicks and just walking around looking at paintings, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I mean, I mostly just introduce what's right there before us. I just look a little more carefully than, than most people. I'm usually just showing something that anyone can see, but, but not everyone has the patience to, to look carefully, but as I, you know, as I said about the current, I mean, you're almost always rewarded if you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, I hope I see you. Well, I will see you here, but uh, Sarah will see you uh, next week. We have a great one to learn next week. Um, Come see the show though, and we would love to hear your comments next week or in the weeks if you come back to Munch and Learns about what you actually saw and at the Dixon. Um, our next week, Munch and Learn, is the impact of the 1866 Memphis massacre on the lives of Black women by Dr. Beverly Bond from uh, this professor of African American history at the University of Memphis. This should be yeah. really, really interesting. Uh, I hope you can join us. Um, and if you still have, if you think of a question for Kevin later on, uh, just send him an email or send me an email um, or, you know, bring it back next week. Maybe he's around, he can answer. Uh, oh. Thank you so much for, for everything. Kevin, any last words? No, thanks for being with us. And um, yeah, come to the Dixon. <laughs>